since, since we, we're talking about structural changes, one thing you get is increased number of mitochondria with training. So when you detrain, this says about 50% of the increase that you got was lost after one week. So they're kind of saying, look, you train, you got this good increase in mitochondria, in a week you lose about half, right? And then it says, after about five weeks, you lose all of it. So it's kind of giving you some time frame. You, you detraining for five weeks, you lose you know, quite a bit. And then if you want to retrain, after you did all this detraining stuff, it takes, it takes you a while, four weeks, to regain the stuff you, you got originally. And so this next picture will, will say exactly what this is. This is, and this is a y-axis, muscle fiber mitochondrial content in arbitrary units. So there's no numbers here, it's just saying, with weeks of detraining or training. Here I am, I'm untrained, I train, and within the first week I get a pretty good increase in mitochondria, right? And so with training, I, get a, I can double my mitochondria. So after it looks like about four or five weeks of training, I can double my mitochondria, right? That's pretty good. And you say, all right, what happens when you detrain? Well, you lose about half of it in a week. Half of the gain you made is lost in a week. If you, you know, the rest of it you lose after, you, know, you go back down to normal after another five weeks or four weeks. And so this one says if you decrease, you know, 50% and you try to retrain, you know, you're, you only detrain for one week, it takes you about four weeks to get back, you know, to, to get back to where you were. Good enough? So bottom line is don't detrain. Um, I don't know what you guys feel like subjectively when you don't exercise. Do you, do you can't do it. Like, do you exercise every day? Yeah, I feel like it's more like therapeutic than anything. Yeah, I, I've been riding to and from work, and my, my leg muscles are just really fatigued, almost overtrained. And on Sunday, I said, okay, I'm going to just I'm gonna relax. And it was nice outside. I said, well, maybe I can just go out for a short bike ride. So I just did like 12 miles of easy. But just to stir the, my buddy calls taking a walk, stirring your stumps. I just had to stir my stumps and get out there. But uh, I don't know how long I've, it takes for me to detrain. Like, I don't know. With this kind of thing, if I'm losing mitochondria in a week, if I stop exercising for a week, I don't know if I really, I think I feel it probably. I think I subjectively feel like I'm losing something. All right, so, so detraining can decrease your mitochondrial number, just like in, increases occur with training. Uh, let me see. All right, this is going to be a little bit harder to understand, but there's a big picture. So the top says effective intensity and duration on mitochondrial enzymes. So they pick cytochrome citrate, citrate synthase as the enzyme they're going to look at. They, they cite this study. And it's a marker, so if I have more of it, I've got more mitochondrial oxidative capacity. So that's why they chose that, that enzyme. And when you read this, and it's kind of confusing, but think about this for a second. If I do light to moderate exercise training, we said there was something, when I exercise walking around the room, what muscle fibers do I recruit first, the fast twitch or the slow twitch? Slow. So and it's, it's called the size principle. The slow twitch are smaller, so I recruit those first. And then if I go harder and harder and harder or higher up on the treadmill, then I start increasing, I start recruiting the fast twitch. So light to moderate, I'm recruiting you know, the slow twitch, the oxidative fibers. This says, well, if I'm going to use this as a marker to see what happens when I train this way, then I'm going to have an increased citrate synthase in those fibers. The, the, if you did a biopsy and looked at my my slow twitch muscle fibers, and they're, they're calling them type 1 and some 2A, but think about your oxidative fibers, because these are slow oxidative, right? And these are fast oxidative and glycolytic. The type 2As were the fog fibers. So they're saying these oxidative fibers will have an increase in citrate synthase, because I was walking around doing moderate exercise, and those are the fibers that would be used. So that's easy to understand. And then they say, well, when you do strenuous exercise, so not like to moderate, but strenuous exercise, then, then I can get increases in that citrate synthase in my faster twitch fibers, my type 2Bs or 2Xs. And why? Because when I do this kind of exercise, that's when I'm recruiting. So big, big picture is you get the improvements in the muscle fibers that you use. So if you're using light to moderate exercise, you get the improvements in those type 1s, the oxidatives. If you're doing strenuous, you get the 2Bs. Another way to say this is there's a specificity. Right? The training is specific. 
Does that make sense to you guys? It, you know, it, it's, I hope it does. Oh, I see a stringer hit here. Writing down quick things. <laughs> he does know this part. So what was the part about 2B? So, so bottom line is, exercise like a moderate, you find the increases in the oxidative capacity of those fibers that you use. Exercise strenuous, you see the oxidative capacity of, this, oh, of the strenuous fibers you use. Yeah, so those so are you can think of somebody walking on the treadmill, somebody running uphill. And you know, when you're running uphill, that's, you're, you're recruiting fast switch fibers. So you know, hopefully those would be trained. If you're walking on flat, you just walk around the park blocks, you're going to be using slow twitch muscle fibers your fast switch fibers aren't going to improve. They're, they're not doing anything. Okay, I don't, I don't, I'm beating it to death, but the picture here is saying the same thing. Um, unfortunately, this is a. Let me see. This this bottom figure has has some colors wrong. But what they're saying is, if I'm looking at, let's call this red gastrocnemius. Let's call these oxidative fibers. If I if I'm looking at my oxidative fibers, if I do, this is light, moderate, and heavy exercise. So you guys agree that if I walk around the room, I recruit oxidative fibers. If I jog around the room, I recruit oxidative fibers, maybe some fast switch. If I run hard uphill, I'm recruiting oxidative and fast switch. So the oxidatives are always starting out. They're always being used no matter what. Light intensity, long, you know, they're, they're always being used. So, we're looking at citrate synthase activity. If I look at oxidative fibers, they increase, this is basically saying you can increase just by any exercise intensity you do. You know, 55, 65, 75, it doesn't matter because they're, they're used first, so they, they show improvements. This one says, well, if you look at a white gastrocnemia, so this is the fast twitch fiber, those aren't used until you do the heavy exercise. So what's bad about this is 55 is in the middle here. It's supposed to be down here. So this is low exercise, moderate exercise, high exercise. Where you see the biggest improvements in citrate synthase activity when they're being used. That's what that's saying. When they're, they're being used at 75%, they're not being as used as much at 55%, so there's less of an improvement in that muscle fiber type. It says the same thing as the previous slide, that the changes in the enzyme activity is specific to the type of training you do. What is the what do the numbers represent? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I see that I've got like a, there's a mistake here. Uh, I don't know what the units are. I think I just took it right. Yeah, it's right out of the textbook. McGraw Hill. Yeah, who knows? So higher activity top, lower activity bottom. I guess I don't. I don't know. There's, there's a higher level. I mean, it's the top, the above graph starts at 60, and the bottom graph then goes. Oh, to you know, I think you're the second person that, that uh, told me that. He said, "Hey, look, the axes are different." So, you know, I guess. It's interesting, you notice it, I didn't even notice it. So you'd say, this is pretty high activity in the 70s and 80s because it's a slow twitch fiber, so it should have lots of oxidative activity. Whereas, okay, we're, we're talking a different scale, so this is like way down, and there's improvements, but it's, it's interesting that you'd say, yeah, a fast twitch fiber isn't gonna have a whole lot of oxidative enzyme. So yeah, that's interesting. I skipped it, I skipped the y-axis. Okay, potential exam stuff. This is important, and it's, kind of hard to think about. It says mitochondrial number and AVP concentration, it stands for concentration, on VO2. So here's what I want you guys to think about. This, I'll read this first. It says the AVP concentration stimulates mitochondrial ATP production. Remember we said there's a guy out in the hallway and, and he's, if, if you know nothing about him, you don't even know what he's doing. You, I just say there's somebody out there and he's filling up with AVP. His ADP concentration is going up. That's a signal that he's exercising because he's making the ADP because he's breaking down the ATP from doing whatever he's doing out there. So if his ADP concentration is going up, I'm thinking he's exercising. Okay. And you guys agree that if his ADP concentration is going up, that's going to stimulate oxygen uptake because that's a signal. A your body's going, hey, you run out of energy. We better, we better increase the oxygen uptake because that will give us the energy we need to get the ATP back to do the work. Right? Negative feedback? Mm -hmm. So this stimulates oxygen uptake. ADP concentration stimulates oxygen uptake. So this rest of it says um, 
you, we all agree that I've got increased mitochondria number after training. So I had, I had one before training, now after training I've got two, let's say, I've doubled, right? Here's the hard part to understand. That means there's a lower ADP that's needed to increase the, the ATP production and the VO2. And, and it's gonna be clear when you see this next picture, but what I'm, what I'm trying, that'll be clear when you see this next picture. Do you guys, you guys get this, that your ADP stimulates your, oxy, your oxygen uptake, right? If, if I increase my ADP concentration, I'm gonna consume more oxygen because that's, it's a feedback signal. Here's, here's the big, big picture, and it's, it's kind of cartoonish, and in some of it's, you go, what the hell are you talking about? This is before training. I've got one mitochondria. So just pretend this is a guy with just one mitochondria, and he's got enzymes, he's got all that stuff that's in there. And, and here's the hard part to think about. Let's say this guy, before training, he's, it says his VO2 is two liters a minute. So I'm on train, I've just got one big mitochondria, I'm pushing the pedals around the bike at 50 RPM on a Monarch at whatever setting it is, but whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm doing on this bike requires me to consume two liters of oxygen a minute. That's, it's just given. It's like when she was at one and a half KP on the Monarch at 50 RPM, I think her oxygen uptake was 1.13, right? So it's just, when I'm on the bike pedaling at two, it takes me two liters a minute. When you're on the bike at two, it takes you two liters a minute. When you're on the bike at two, it takes you two liters a minute. Everybody, when they're riding the Monarch at 50 RPM at 2 KP, require two liters per minute. It feels different for each of us because you're trained, I'm not, I'm old, you're, you know, right? So, it, it, but we all have to consume two liters to push those pedals around oxidatively. That's just, you gotta just imagine that. Now, how did I get that two liters? How did I, how did I, why, how did my body know that I needed two liters? Well, my ADP concentration went up and it went up it, it, this is sort of like, you gotta, you gotta just trust me on this. For, for me to consume two liters of oxygen, because that's what I need, my ADP concentration's gotta go up to 100, whatever it is, you know. You, so if it goes, if my ADP concentration goes up to 100, I consume two liters. That's it, that's just the relationship, all right? And you go, all right, let's train it. So after training, now I've got these two guys, I've got double what I had here. I'm still pushing the pedals around, I still need two liters a minute. And you go, well, why don't these guys share? This guy only has to consume one, that guy only has to consume one, so now I get my total two because the two mitochondria are sharing the work, right? That's easy enough to think about. You got one mitochondria, they're sharing the work. You go, wait a minute, if it takes 100 units of ADP to increase your VO2 to two, it should only take 50 you know, to increase it. So this guy's one and that guy's one. So it, it's a weird way to think about it, but it's the same in this big picture. It, it takes less of a change in this to get here, because these two guys are sharing the work, they didn't each have to do two, they only had to do one, so I didn't have to increase this so much. Whereas I've only got one, I've got to increase them more to get that. That's big, big sort of idea. And, and I'm looking at this going, that's a good thing. You don't, want, you don't want your ADP concentration to go up as much. That's a good thing, and you'll see why in a second. I'm sharing, I'm sharing the love, sharing the work. But I'm still pushing the pedals around, you know, it takes me two liters of oxygen, okay? Now, the reason I'm talking about ADP concentration, remember this, glucose, there was an enzyme called PFK, that was the rate limiting enzyme, it's a faucet, a facet, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna make this go faster or slower, right? It's gonna stimulate or inhibit. What stimulates this so that I increase my energy pathway to make energy? What would be a signal that would? ADP. Hmm? ADP. ADP. So if ADP concentration is going up, he's exercising. We need energy. Turn this on. Turn this on. Get some energy. Right? It was that feedback signal. So, so if, if this is going up a lot, that's going to go up a lot, right? If that's going up a lot, this is going faster. If this is going faster, pyruvate, pyruvate, got the NADHs even, we got the NADHs. If this is going by really fast, I'm gonna be making lactic acid, right? Because it's, it's going really fast. You guys agree? 
this went up, stimulated that, stimulated that. Okay, that's this, right? It went up. If it doesn't, have, if it doesn't go up as much, if this is going up less, and let's make it a small arrow. This now he's trained. This doesn't stimulate it so much. It's just a, it's, it doesn't have to stimulate that as much. If I don't stimulate that as much, I don't. This doesn't have to happen as much. I don't make as much lactate. You go, Gary, how can you do this? Because this is what we need down here. We need this Krebs cycle stuff. And if you're turning this guy off, you know, you're not turning him on as much, how are you feeding into here? How would you guys say, if, if, I, if, if this concentration is going up half as much, it's not stimulating this as much, it's not stimulating this as much, not making as much lactate, how the hell am I doing my Krebs cycle? What else feeds into the Krebs cycle? From acetyl CoA, from where? Beta oxidation? Yeah. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I'm taking this acetyl CoA. So you go, all right, look at this. I didn't stimulate glycolysis as much. So that means I didn't make as much lactate because I'm a better fat burner. Why am I a better fat burner? Well, hell, look, I've got all these mitochondria. Fat burning takes place in the mitochondria. That's a good thing. I've got more. Mitochondria that don't require my ADP concentration. This is the, this is a good thing. ADP concentration not going up as much is a good thing. Okay, this hard to wrap your head around, but two mitochondria is better than one. You guys, you guys get the fact that it, if I'm on the bike and I'm pedaling at two kp, same rate, you know, power output of. I don't know, 300 kilogram meters per minute, or let, I'll say 100 watts. I'm pedaling at 100 watts. It's going to cost me some oxygen. You guys pedal at 100 watts. It's going to cost you pretty much the same amount of oxygen. It's just, it's just that's what it costs. We all get it differently. Maybe my heart's bigger. Maybe my muscles are. I have more slow twitch or fast twitch or I'm fitter. So it's it's it's, it's a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. That just pushing those pedals around, it costs everybody about the same. You know, you get somebody like Lance Armstrong. He might be a little more efficient. A lot more efficient, but it's, it's still going to cost him. It's like right now, you guys are, it's costing you, you got to consume 3.5 mLs per kg, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5. 3 it's just, how are we getting it? You know, if you're really fit, maybe your heart's not beating as fast and you got a bigger stroke volume and you got a bigger extraction. So, but it costs us all 3.5 approximately. All right. Uh, this is talking about the oxygen deficit. And you guys are going, oh, God, we, we did that back in chapter four. And the famous picture was exercise, steady state, and then recover. So the oxygen deficit, you guys know, is at the beginning of exercise. And this is just saying the oxygen deficit is smaller. And we saw a slide that said, you know, a trained person gets up there sooner. Right? So we saw that already. Oxygen deficit is lower following training. Uh, so, so the, the trained person is getting up to that steady state faster, and they're not increasing their ADP concentration. It's kind of what we said in those previous two slides. They're, they're just getting there faster, and their ADP concentration didn't have to go up as high because those two mitochondria shared the, the oxygen uptake. Uh, if, if, this is, if my oxygen uptake gets there faster, I'm less anaerobic, right? So I'm more oxidative. If I'm more oxidative, I'm going to make less lactate, so that's a good thing. So it's kind of saying everything sort of, a, it's relating training with oxidative systems and anaerobic systems and saying, if I can do stuff more oxidatively, that's a good thing. I get less PC depletion because I don't have to use my anaerobic systems. I make less lactate. It's all good stuff. You know, one way to look at it, you, I'll bet you guys would, would be able to say this. If, if I took a highly trained person and an untrained person and had them both ride at 2 kp on a bike, the untrained person would say, oh, this is harder <laughs> because they're probably making more lactate. Right? Their muscles aren't as trained. The trained person is going to say, oh, this is easy. So no lactate being made hardly at all. And they're doing things oxidatively and happily. All right, this is, this is the picture I just drew on the board. It says there's a faster increase in oxygen uptake. Before training, there's a slower, all right? Less lactate formation and less PC depletion. So this is kind of what we said. 
I always ask questions like, you know, the, the oxygen deficit before, the oxygen deficit would be, let's see, after training, the oxygen deficit is a smaller B, larger C, unchanged D, uh, something else in E, something else. It's smaller. After training, it's smaller. The oxygen deficit is smaller. Yes? Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about fat oxidation, biochemical changes, and free fatty acid oxidation. Those are all the carbons that we get from beta oxidation. Well, you go back, as we just said, we get more mitochondria and we get more capillaries after training. Guess what? If you, if you got more mitochondria, you've got more mitochondrial enzymes, more fat beta oxidation enzymes, you got more capillaries, you got more blood flow. It says you have an increased capacity to transport free fatty acids from the plasma to the cell. This is, there's a lot we could say about this, but when you think about free fatty acids, they have to be, let, let's not think about triglycerides in my muscle, think about my fat. So I'm, I wanna be a good fat burner. I've gotta, I've gotta break down the triglyceride in my fat, let's chop those three carbons off, the three carbon chains off with lipases. I've gotta get it into my blood, my blood's gotta transport it, it's gotta transport it to the muscle, it's gotta get into the muscle, then in the muscle, it's gotta get into the mitochondria. So it's like all these different steps you go, oh man, that's a that's a long series of steps. It's it's kind of like a bunch of like salmon going up different dams, I guess. There's there's a lot of different steps that I have to go through with exercise training, aerobic exercise training. I get an increased capacity to transport. Right? Is it along those steps? So I've got fatty acid transporters, and and it's, without getting into too much detail, I can I can burn more fat. I'm a better fat burner after aerobic training. And we said, we said there was beta oxidation, drew a circle on the board. Well, I've got increased enzymes associated with beta oxidation. We didn't talk about, I didn't give you any rate limiting enzymes. We just said there was a circle called beta oxidation. You guys know if I've got more enzyme activity, I can make more acetyl-CoA because that's what beta oxidation does. It, it chops off those two carbon units. If I can chop off more two carbon units, I can feed those into the Krebs cycle. I burn more fat. If I burn more fat, I use less glycogen and glucose. So, so all that stuff is, you look at this and you say, if you want to become a better fat burner, exercise training is the, the best way. And this is kind of saying logically why. You can become a better fat burner by eating a higher fat diet. You know, that people have said, hey, you know, we've talked about carbohydrate loading, right? I think if, yeah. if I want a carbohydrate, if I want to run a race, I want to be, if I super pack my body with carbohydrate, that's a good thing. So people have said the same thing about fat. They said, I wonder if we could fat load. You know, we know that, that if, you in, if you eat a high fat diet, your body tends to burn fat. So eat, they'll eat a high fat diet for a couple days and then see if when they go exercise, does their RER go down, or does the, the, are they better fat burners? And you know, some people have said yeah, that's, it's not like carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is definitely a good thing. A high fat or fat loading, it's like they, they, they do the studies and they they'll find no increase in performance, or they'll find a little bit of an increase in fat use, but not enough to make any difference. And then they end with saying, well, we wouldn't recommend this anyways because it's high fat diet in America is a bad thing and heart disease, and so. But you, it, your diet can increase your fat oxidation, but training is the better way. So this is putting it all together, saying hey, when you when you want to talk about fat oxidation and how you spare glucose. So I'm looking at this. I say.